hopefully you're you're seeing this. Yay, okay, that was good. Um what I need to see. Get this guy open. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Clarence Martin, give a brief overview of um, his impact or his activities, especially when it comes to Cheney. Um, Clarence Martin was born in Cheney. His family came from Ohio and he moved, they came here shortly before he was born, probably about 1883 or 84. Um, so he became the first native born mayor of Cheney and the first native born governor of the state of Washington. He went to Cheney schools and then went on to the University of Washington. At the age of 20, after he graduated from the university, he returned home to join his father in business. And together they established the FM Martin Grain and Milling Company in 1907. Uh, the Martins, particularly uh, Papa Frank, um, probably had a hand in convincing the Washington Water Power Company to bring the electric train branch line out to Cheney because he promised that he would be buying power from them to run his proposed milling operation. And Cheney did have a private electric company at the time, but it lacked the capacity and the reliability to run a electric intensive operation. Uh, Clarence became a member of the Men's Commercial Club, which is kind of like the Chamber of Commerce. And at the age of 29 in 1915, he made his first venture into politics when he was elected to the city council. His role at the mill grew until he was kind of the guy that was in charge of the overall operations and the contracts of the mill. Um, so by, we get to around 1917 at the start of World War I and the government is, you know, putting out orders and contracts, um, they began, they realized that their old mill was no longer going to be, um, have the capacity, the modern equipment to go forward in time. So at the beginning of 1918, they start constructing a um, new concrete mill. Um, this map is from 1916, and it gives you a little orientation. This is that wooden mill building that we were seeing. Um, this little building up here, chop mill, is for chopping up um, grain for cattle feed or feed for animals. Um, and over here where it says Ratcliffe Lumber Yard, uh, that is the land that the Martins bought from Charlie Ratcliffe to put their new mill on. So the new mill is being built on the west side of the block and our train depot is a block away down here. So they're running the mill 24 seven because of the war effort. But on the Sunday, April 14th, 1918, the, the mill was closed and four maintenance men were going in and uh, working when there was an explosion or a series of explosions and a fire. Three of the men were on the bottom floor of the mill and they were able to escape. The fourth man was up on the third floor up here. And when he opened the door, it was smoke came billowing up at him. He could feel the heat and he knew he wasn't going out that door. He looked around and decided his only option was to jump out one of the windows and down onto the roof of the lower part of the building and then to the ground. And he did it and amazingly was not hurt. <laughs> um, you can see in the foreground that this is the new construction of the mill that's going on. So I don't get to show these pictures very often. So, I mean, I, this is the first time they've been in public. <laughs> so. I, I just have to show fire pictures. Um, this is the chop mill in the foreground that's burning. Um, and you probably can't really see very well in the image, but toward the back, there is part of the mill that's um, becoming a skeleton. In my last fire picture, um, everything is pretty much gone. The thing that I note is that this is 1918 and they are fighting this fire with hand-pulled hose carts. 
So they did their best and nothing else caught fire. Volunteers were able to pull two grain cars, railroad cars, away or push them down the track so that they would not catch fire. Martin was home at the time. He comes down on Sunday morning, finds out what's going on, and then immediately sets to work contacting all the little mills in the rural areas surrounding Cheney to shift the government contracts off to them and to also make up for what was in the mill and burned up that day. Um, he was able to do all of that and later boasted that less than a week uh, was lost in completing those contracts. So the mill, the new mill was completed by the end of the year and was taking its first ship shipments early in 1919. He gets himself elected mayor at the age of 42 in 1928. Martin's Mill is the largest employer in town and probably the largest customer for the Northern Pacific Railroad here. Um, he is a prominent businessman. He's you know, connected to the various organizations. He's got contacts in the railroad company. And this does in fact put him in the most excellent position to be the guy who requested our non-standard designed depot. So just want, I love showing pictures off. <laughs> this is when the mill is very new. Um, as mayor, he's able to, um, you know, access the funds from state to improve sewers and roads in Cheney, among other kinds of things. Um, but also he was frustrated with the um, local electric companies slow progress in getting streetlights out. So in the name of his father, he donated money to have 55 ornamental streetlight standards put up um, in the downtown area and up um, to College Avenue. And this happens to be one of them in this photo. He runs for governor in 1932, traveling by train for the most part throughout the state. He stopped at a lot of little towns and talked to a lot of uh, people to find out what their needs were as we're, you know, we're in the depression. Um, he used mostly his own money uh, so that he was not beholden to anybody when he was elected. And so he entered office in January of 1933 at the height of the Depression, and his focus was on tax relief for local governments, um, trying to shore up schools, and uh, making sure that there were jobs projects going on. Perhaps his biggest legacy um, is the Grand Coulee Dam. And in 1933, he also convinced the legislature to basically bet the state to back the Cooley Dam project and convince the federal government that this would be a jobs project that would be very helpful during the Depression era and would have long lasting uh, impact on the modernization of the United States. Um, he had the state issue a bond for $377,000 in 1933, a lot of money. Um, they bought it. Uh, the federal government went ahead with the project. And in 1933, he attended the groundbreaking ceremony. And on December 6th of 1935, he donned work clothes and rubber boots to pour the first official bucket of concrete at the dam. And he later said that it was one of the most thrilling events of his lifetime. They even issued him a check, 75 cents. He earned for an hour's work um, on the at the dam, and he didn't cash the check, so hey, he made a you know a donation to the effort. Um, it did, in fact, turn out to be nationally one of the most successful brought jobs projects during the depression. It also brought water into the very dry center of the state and produced electricity, which allowed rural communities to finally start connecting up to have lights and power. Um, he commuted by train 
between Olympia and Cheney while he was both governor and mayor in the period between 1932 and 1936. Um, Though I have to mention that his mayor pro tem here in Cheney was grocer Alex Hughes, who took care of a lot of the business of the city. Um, so as I said before, he was shoring up schools. He did a lot of work um, for helping rural schools through tax equalization laws that he was able to get passed and also that normal schools could begin to offer bachelor's degrees. And then uh, he was the, he signed that our Cheney Normal School became Eastern Washington College of Education in 1937. Uh, when he retired from the governorship in 1940, he said, oh, I'm retiring and he bought himself, um, collected about 3,000 acres worth of farmland down toward Plaza. And there he had worked with his tenant farmers to bring in the latest equipment, um, study and try out the latest methods and the latest varieties of grain. And uh, from what little I can find out, it was, he was quite successful in directing these farms and had good tenant farmers doing the work for him. Um, he was a person who understood the value of publicity and got himself in the newspapers quite a bit. Um, you know, so here he is, you know, folksy guy, um, and he happens to be talking to Dr. Francis Pomeroy and his wife, Mamie, who were um, pioneers in Cheney. The family did sell the mill in 1943 for reportedly a million dollars in cash. Um, and so he could have been doing a lot of things, but he was a person who felt the need to be involved and to do service. And so he was appointed by the Spokane County Commissioners uh, to uh, another term in the state legislature to fill a, a vacancy. And he did end up being on the C Cheney City Council for another term. His last big hurrah for publicity and for the city of Cheney was in convincing um, President Harry Truman and Warren Magnuson, our senator, to bring Truman to Cheney as a courtesy call. And so on their return from another dedication ceremony at the Grand Coulee Dam, President Truman uh, did make a stop in Cheney on May 11, 1950. Um, you can see the depot behind the train. Um, and, you know, Governor Martin met them at the station. They got into a uh, convertible and they drove up College Avenue, met with students up there at the Herculean Pillars. And then uh, a lot of handshaking um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, picture taking and then Truman got back in the uh, convertible and they drove out of town while Cheney people lined the streets on his way out of town. So we had a presidential visit. <laughs> um, he then retired more fully, uh, but he had one last thing in the newspaper when uh, on an evening in 1954, um, as the Martins were preparing to go to bed, um, they heard a huge noise and discovered their front door was destroyed and there was a big piece of metal out front. And it turned out that a, an, an exhaust pipe from a Northwest Airlines DC-4 had fallen off the plane, uh, dropped and hit the ground and then bounced into their front door rather than any of their windows. Um, and she <laughs> basically shattered the door. Um, he was active in life on a number of boards um, until a few months before he passed away in, in his home on August 11, 1955. So here was a man born in Cheney and who passed away in Cheney. And that's my story of Clarence Martin. So, 
thanks a lot, Joan. That is absolutely fascinating. I think I think that's a historical story that uh, very few of us uh, knew before, and we appreciate your 